right. Now, this will tell us. And that's pretty conclusive. Still going. Close. I think he got it down. How strong is he? Welcome back to the Pick and Go podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Super Rugby. And once again, in studio, I'm joined by Pity Weepu. Pity, uh, long weekend just gone. How'd, how'd you uh, spend your long weekend? I actually went to uh, Māori, Martinborough, and uh, took the kids to a mate's uh, house, and they pretty much went ramping on the on the farm <laughs> the mum was on the quarter bike didn't want to get off it uh the daughter wanted to drive uh the cannon the car the quad bike feed the bloody animals i was like ah not it not all of them you can eat uh feed me <laughs> eat oh, all right hey, you oh, can eat them though oh, you can eat eat them. Them. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah just had a bit of a family trip away and yeah, it was quite nice Nice, nice. And, uh, of course, once again, we're joined by uh, Surly up there in the Big Smoke, Auckland. Surly, uh, how was your long weekend? Yeah, no complaints. Uh, shot up north, which was quite nice. Played a bit of golf, which was good, if you could call it playing golf. I think golf played me, but it was a, it was a pleasure to be out there. And then, yeah, on Sunday, back to uh, head along to the Fortress, Mount Smart. So what more could you ask for? Golf and, uh, and watching plenty of footy. Not bad. What course and what did you shoot? I uh, went up. There's a local um, 18 hole donation box course at Nangaru. So um, just played nine holes there across the two days. Uh, so she was good, 34 and 32, but she's a pretty easy course. So that was over the nine each day. Um, so yeah, it's not that testing, but looks good on your Golf New Zealand, you know, index when you chuck it in there. And the boys think, geez. Surly's going great guns. He's shooting low 30s for nine holes. Little do they know they're all par threes, and that was double bogeys on each. So happy days. <laughs> <laughs> Mangaru, what's the closest major town to Mangaru then? Uh, it would be Whangarei for sure, about half an hour out. But um, yeah, I might make the venture up to Hikarangi next time, play there, because apparently that's a, that's a nice little course as well. I'll tell you what, if you're shooting low 30s at uh, Hikurangi, then um, yeah, we'll be having a good look at your handicap, fair dinkum. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, I don't think I will be poorly, mate, but I appreciate the confidence. I'll, I'll keep you posted anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right, back to Super Rugby. Uh, and it was a big, big weekend last weekend. Mm. And unfortunately for the Hurricanes, uh, they came out with the right result. Um, but boy, oh boy, did it cost them with the uh, big injury. Uh, to Cam Royguard. So the question for this week to both of you guys, uh, with Cam Royguard out for a significant amount of time now, who is the obvious number one, number nine? Um, of course, with the uh, All Black, uh, uh, I guess, schedule coming up later on in the year, um, with uh, Aaron Smith gone, uh, Cam Royguard was the obvious. And he was, in my opinion, he was the clear favourite um, and he was ahead by three or four lengths um, in front of the other runners. So we'll go to you first, Surly. Who do you think right now is the number one, and and who do you think will be the halfback pick for the first test of the season for the All Blacks? Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? First of all, you got to feel for Roy Gard. Like, he was playing so well again on the weekend, and it was interesting. I was talking to Bryn Hall the other day, and he called him the form player of Super Rugby and probably his favourite player to watch at the moment. So it's just such a shame, but there is a bit of optimism that it could be in that kind of six- to eight-week period, which would mean for that July window he would be back. But, yeah, it, it is tough. When you talk about an obvious replacement i don't think there is one because for me then the rest of them are quite bunch like you've got finlay christie who is probably that next incumbent you could say because he was a part of that world cup squad he was coming off the bench for aaron smith last year so you'd have to think he probably gets first crack at it but i'm i'm loving the return of tj pedernata so 
it's going to be an interesting watch because in an All Black team that could look quite different, they might turn to some leadership and some experience there and give TJ the nod. Um, for Lau Fakatava as well, probably the Highlanders' best again on the weekend. For me, though, he's more of that bench option just to bring a bit of razzle and, and a bit of a running game and really up the tempo there in that last 25-ish minutes. So I think between TJ and Christy, it's going to be a heck of a battle between those two. Pity. Uh... TJ's almost as old as you, isn't he? Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <I'm> older. <laughs> yeah, you're younger than TJ, aren't you? No, I retired <laughs> real early. <laughs> <laughs> I did, nothing against TJ, and, and he came on and did a fantastic job for the Hurricanes when, uh, unfortunately, Roy Gard uh, was stretched off. Um, so I guess he has put his hand up. Um, I look at some of the teams, and I look at the Chiefs, and... I'm not sure that they've decided who their number one halfback yeah. is, though. Ha how hard it will it, will it be for Scotty Robertson um, when he uh, goes about naming his first ever uh, All Black squad? And does that bring another sort of dimension in? Because new All Black coach, so does it wipe the slate clean for every halfback and we all start again, or will Scott Robertson go? Well, look, Finlay Christie was the incumbent behind Aaron Smith uh, last season. So he gets first dibs, or will he look at the, I guess, the form of every single halfback going around and go, well, you're the guy who's playing the best at the moment. You're going to be my first pick. Yeah, I guess it's it's a tough one. Um, you know, obviously that's in a key role as well. Uh, the, so you, you want a bit of experience in there. You don't want to sort of have someone that's uh, never pretty much uh, driven the game or, or, or a team around uh, at that level. And TJ is obviously uh, your number one person when it comes to that. Um, but I mean, he's still got to find form. I know his his early days in terms of uh, from returning uh, from his injury. Um, but you know, it's it's a uh, it's a good. I guess it's a good headache because then it looks at uh, not only now but also the future in terms of uh, him trying to uh, keep an eye on uh, players that could potentially uh, knock on on that door for uh, you know for selection. So. Um, it's a, I'd probably, if I'm using my coaching brain, I, I'd look at TJ first with, uh, with Christy, uh, and like Surly said, you know, you've got, uh, the likes of Fagatava who can sort of, uh, add a bit of razzle dazzle, but then you've got to just try and make sure you get the right mold. Do you start with someone like Christy, speed the game up, uh, try and keep the energy high and then, uh, finish with someone like TJ, uh, that can close the game out. Uh, but still have um, that opportunity to drive the team as well. I guess uh, I guess another factor that Robertson will probably take into consideration early is uh, Richie Moonga gone. Um, so it, it's possible there may be um, a, a lack of experience in the number ten jersey as well. Although they do have DMAC who's playing very very well for the Chiefs. Um, does that make the case even stronger for someone like TJ to, because he's been there, done that before, um, and he? you don't want to be going into a, a test match with, I guess, almost a brand new sort of 19 pairing? Yeah, I guess Christie's probably spent a bit of time with DMAC as well across that World Cup campaign and over the last couple of years. I think something else to factor in as well is, you know, we're taking on England in these tests. So does TJ's game play, you know, he's a bit more physical, slightly larger body, gets stuck in defensively as well. And he's just got that experience. I, I, you know, we expect England to really take us on up front. So does that suit TJ a little more? Do we go with Christie and just try skin them? And play a bit quicker and, and beat them on tempo so the best thing is that regardless of losing one of the best nines in the world at the moment on form we still have three options where you could see them go either way and then you look at the depth and guys like Noah Hotham on the weekend put his hand up to show that over this World Cup cycle he's going to be a name that comes into contention Cortez Ratama, Xavier Rowe like you said we've got six really good halfbacks and three world-class halfbacks so it's a pretty good problem to have in a position where we have more depth than we do in others like if, a, if this was a Damian McKenzie with Peter Feta picking up a niggle as well then I'd be slightly more panicked it sucks for Roy Gard but luckily we're quite good in our halfback stocks right hand on heart Surly. who does Scott Robertson pick 
to wear the number nine jersey for the first test match of the season for the All Blacks? It's probably the hardest question to ask anyone is to think like Razor, right? Because who knows what that bloke's thinking. He loves thinking out the box. But uh, first test, I think he'll go with Finlay Christie. Finlay. Pity? On current form now, uh, yeah, I'd probably go with Christy only because TJ's only had a couple of chances to uh, to have a crack. But, I mean, like Sally said, there's bloody opportunities for all these boys to put their hands up. Like, I've, I've been impressed with uh, Roe and Ratima as well in terms of uh, their game. So, you know, it just depends on what dynamic that he wants. But at the moment, yeah, Christy in terms of, uh, you know, he's had the more consistency with uh, footy. Right. I know we all wish... Cam, the, the quickest recovery, and, and we see him back on the field um, ready to go very, very soon. Uh, I guess the next big question would be, do we see Robertson breakdance after an All Blacks victory in the middle of the field? No, we'll move on from that one. We'll leave that one for another another show. Um, let's have a quick look back at the results from last week. Uh, hello. <laughs> the Crusaders are on the board. Ho, ho, ho. I, picked it. I picked the first one before the Canes lost. Hold on, I'm just having a look oh. at the tipping. Uh, res- oh, that one. The results here, the, where we put <laughs> actually money down, and I believe that every single one of us went with the Chiefs in some form. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, and they let, and of course we did it before. I'm pretty sure we did it before the teams were named, and we possibly may have uh, decided to go a different way if we'd known that D Mac uh, was going to be uh, rested. And I, I think it just goes to show how important he is to that Chiefs outfit. Uh, they went down 37-26 to the Crusaders. They were never really in the game, to be fair. The, the Chiefs, the Crusaders got out to a quick start and just kept kept the foot down. Uh, Surly, how did you see the game? Yeah, I was impressed with the way the Crusaders played. They looked like a team that was playing with a bit of freedom. They kind of throw on that textbook Crusader style of play out the window. They were quick tapping off penalties. They wanted to lift the tempo. I think the injection of Hotham in that nine jersey with a bit more youth, he was ready to run all day long. Um, Johnny McNichol, jeez, I didn't see that coming from him. Well, I think he's 33 years old. He looked like the best player out there on the paddock. So welcome back to New Zealand rugby for him. But yeah, it was just great to see them get a win. Um, they were playing like a team that, you know, were looking forward to the bye this week. They knew they'd have the chance to rest some legs, so they just threw everything at one of the competition front runners. They were physical on defence. They bashed the Chiefs. They were up for it, so congratulations to them. And I think you could sense the relief on full time throughout that team. And the best thing for them now, they get back Blackadder, they get back Fergus Burke, post that bye. So, yeah, they're in for a nice little run against some Aussie teams, which they'll be licking their lips at. You only need five or six wins in this competition and you make the eight. So if they can get all bums back on deck by that finals time, you don't want to be playing them. So, yeah, well done to Rob Penny and co, because I'm sure the noise was ever growing and I'm sure the players were starting to look around the room a little. But to get a win against the Chiefs, those Bears post-game would have tasted pretty sweet. I'd like to think that the Pick and Go podcast had a wee bit to do with that victory for the Crusaders as we had uh, Crusader great Israel Dag on the podcast last week. He to took try. the Chiefs. He <laughs> took the Chiefs. <laughs> I, I, I think, think he Cru- was his head, not his heart on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Crusader fans would be very happy with the fact that he took the Chiefs. He's uh, he's um, got the kiss of death sometimes when it comes <laughs> to flipping out rugby teams. Uh, so, uh, pity the... The bookies have been reluctant to really push the Crusaders out in the outright market for Super Rugby uh, Pacific 2024. They got out to $7 before last week's round of games. Bang, one win, uh, and they're straight into $5.50. So they're keeping them very, very safe. And as Surly says, they probably only need five or six wins to sneak into the playoffs. And then once you get there, uh, as you've said before, Crusader playoff rugby is different from Crusader just regular season footy. Um, So they'll be a very, very dangerous team if, and I think they will, uh, make the playoffs. Um, Out of that game, uh, how about the hooker, uh, Bell, who it it looked like he should have had the number 12 on his back, not not the number two, as he just burst through and and just went round the outside, had a bit of a step, 
Um, and it's, I was waiting for him to get tackled, and it just didn't happen. Um, I was thinking the same too. I, it reminded me of uh, Corey Flynn flying down the uh, left wing, uh, scoring against uh, us against the Blues when we played uh, when we, when I was with the Blues. But um, oh, please, don't, we we don't <laughs> want to mention that uh, period, buddy. But uh, yeah, I mean, as he did talk about them just being the usual direct, uh, just smash and bash. Um, they used to be the schoolboy, uh, our schoolyard bullies. And they haven't been like that for the obviously the first five rounds, and then finally they get the opportunity to actually get it right, and uh, they pretty much did that. They did what they usually do, which is go out there, frustrate the hell out of the team, uh, do the niggly things, but at the same time they're getting the job done. And I mean, yeah, you know, I mean I've been there before against the Crusaders, and it's it's so frustrating uh, that you're you're playing really well, but they somehow. Uh, do what they need to do to get under your skin uh, to put you slightly off your game, and then they capitalize on that. So they pretty much did that to the Chiefs on the weekend. And, um, yeah, it was a – I mean, you know, it's a good opportunity for them to, uh, like like Sully said, get the dub and then go away and uh, sort of get refreshed and start focusing on uh, when they come back. Uh, next game uh, for last weekend was the Waratahs up against the Rebels, and I can say that this knocked out a whole heap of multis last weekend with the Rebels upsetting the Tars 27-21. Just the Australian teams just seem to uh, be up one week, down the next week. Certainly when they're playing one, one another, when they've got derbies, uh, it just you can throw the form book out almost sometimes. Um, and just toss the coin up in the air and, and, and take whichever team you want. Surely, the, did you see this uh, coming, upset by the Rebels? No, I didn't. I thought the Tars were going to be too strong, uh, especially at home. The Rebels off-field have been a bit of a shambles, the organisation, but on the field, I was looking at the ladder before. They're one of those teams you don't realise they're coming sick. Like, they're punching well above their weight on the paddock, so well done to them. That was a big scalp for them to claim against a pretty decent Tars side. Like you said before, though, so hard to get a gauge on these Aussie teams. One week they're up, the next week they're down, which I think is... Maybe the difference between the sides like the Canes and that at the moment, like come finals time, you can't have those off weeks. You can't just lift for one big occasion or else you're gone the week after. So it is tough to get a read from them across the ditch. But yeah, well done to the Rebels. They got a tough game this week up against the Drua. So I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, speaking of the Drua pity, uh, they played water polo against the Force and they came <laughs> out on top big time. Drua 31, Force 13. Um, the force, of course, used to playing on top of the ground. I, 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 I don't think there'd ever be a time in uh, Perth where they would have that sort of rain, where it would get to that stage where the the field would be in that sort of state. You would have played in conditions similar to that in uh, Suba. I have, I have, and uh, it was actually ankle deep uh, water, uh, so we we're a bit concerned that if the boys went into a ruck and they were at the bottom of the pile. Uh, there's a possibility they might need a snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they're at home. They play in that type of um, weather all the time. Uh, they don't even need a ball. Sometimes they'll run around with a bloody coconut or something like that. <laughs> yeah. and yes, throw it I've around seen it. Yes. And throw it around and just enjoy, you know, the uh, ability to be freely running around and throwing the ball around. So that, they'll be used to that, obviously. And, um yeah, the conditions weren't, weren't the greatest, but uh, they know how to play in that type of uh, weather. And I mean, I did pick them to uh, get the job done against the uh, against the force. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, Surely, the uh, Blues, who had an away home game at Eden Park, uh, far too strong for Moana Pacifica. And uh, Mark Delia just showing he's one of the hardest uh, players to tackle in world rugby at the moment. Um, I guess just the Blues will be happy with the way uh, they went through their paces uh, in that game and they came out with um, no serious injuries. So uh, W on the board, happy, happy days. Yeah, we kind of spoke of this one as a potential banana skin game because potentially uh, in the past, Moana have been getting up for these clashes against the Blues. So to get a 13-plus win and, and look really convincing in doing so is probably a massive tick in their box. I thought Oscar Satutu was really strong again. And uh, 
Bryce Heem continues to amaze me every time I watch him play. It looks like there's nothing on, and then he'll just find a gap and slice through. So he's become a really important footballer for the Blues over the last couple of seasons in the midfield there. So, yeah, a good box tick for them. Probably quite disappointing for Moana. I expected a little more from them, but, yeah, the Blues just really upped the tempo on them. Perifeta with a sharp kicking game, and they were just too clinical. But pity the... I mean, the Blues did what they needed to do, but Moana, especially defensively, there were some like one-on-one tackles that were just missed that um, you n- normally wouldn't associate uh, with Super Rugby. The, they'll have a bit of work to do going away this weekend. Um, can you see them? I mean, they've already shown that they can play rugby, uh, but that was a poor, poor uh, a display performance by Moana. Uh, certainly when they didn't have the ball, it was, I know uh, the Blues created a number of opportunities, but there were some just one-on-one tackles that Moana just fell off. Yeah, I, I think the sort of the last uh, couple of weeks, they've sort of been uh, letting little things like that creep into their game. And it's, you know, obviously hurting them, especially on the scoreboard. Um, but it feels like they've gone from uh, a strong start to, uh, not having the depth that we talked about in terms of uh, resting some players so that they can uh, bleed a few uh, young boys that are that don't have the experience but still have the opportunity to uh, put their hand up um, with that. So maybe the boys are starting to get a bit tired. I know it's only sort of what, around seven this week um, and, and it can take a toll uh, physically because, you know, if you look at some of the games that they've played, they've put in some massive shifts uh, physically. Um, and, you know, when you're trying to play, back that up week in, week out, it definitely takes a toll on uh, not just your, your body, but also the uh, fitness side of it. Uh, so maybe some of those boys might enjoy uh, having a bit of a break uh, just to recharge the, uh, the battery. Uh, and hopefully they can sort of, um, you know, get back to uh, the way that they started the, the campaign, which was pretty solid. An ultimate game of round six was the Hurricanes travelling down south to take on the Highlanders, and boy, oh boy, uh, right from the out- outset, it was all Canes, to be fair. They were never in any trouble whatsoever. Uh, they controlled pretty much all facets of the game, set pieces. They looked very, very strong. Uh, Surly, uh, outside of Cam Roygaard, the Cam Roygaard injury, uh, too many negatives to take out of that performance against the Highlanders. Nah, you'd have to look very hard to find something to uh, rock the boys up and get under their skin because I thought they were really good yet again. That was another potential, not so much banana skin, but it could have been a real arm wrestle for them down in in front of a a packed zoo there. So well done to the Canes. They're just proving each and every week it doesn't matter who you put up against them. They're going to come with that at least eight or nine out of ten performance. Uh, Ruben Love, outstanding yet again. Braden Yossi, outstanding yet again. He's another one putting his hand up to potentially be in that all-black loose forward trio. They just look like a team that's really confident. They know their style of play. They back their ability, and they're getting it done. So, yeah, they're going to be tough to beat if they can keep this up. Pity, you're very, very close to the Hurricanes camp. You've got all the inside information you there. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're fishing for something, mate. Give it to us. <laughs> Give us the good or uh, you must have been impressed with the way the Hurricanes went about their business last weekend. Yeah, I think they're just, um, like Surly said, they're growing or they're definitely growing in confidence uh, with the ability to play footy. Um, I mean, if you look at Peter Larkai's uh, interplay uh, before he scored his try, um, you know, him seeing that opportunity, straightening up the defender, giving it inside, and then the, just the forwards playing, uh, interplaying it up the middle of the field. But, you know, they've got the good balance between um, the dirty work and then playing, um, you know, uh, heads up footy. Um, you know, in the past, we've, we've been uh, sort of... <laughs> been really good at that. Yeah, uh, and the, the up, yeah. <laughs> Heads up, uh, footy. That's what we've always been good at. But it's it's the it's the dark areas that uh, sometimes we're good in some games, but not consistently good. And you know, for the last six weeks, the boys have turned up, done the job. Uh, whether it's um, you know 
going into the dark holes and cleaning people out or uh you know set pieces have been pretty strong usually it's a it's a tough one because they're not very very strong well they haven't been strong uh in the past but i mean you know set pieces starting to look really good it was a good battle actually between uh tyrell and the group mm. you know just that battle mm. uh that was definitely one to keep an eye on because uh i think tyrell might have got up a couple times uh on his old mate um but i mean just the way that the, the those boys especially the pack are working really hard to uh do all the do all the hard jobs but not only that when they do get their chance to express themselves they're you know beating defenders tipping playing with the ball and uh, seeing opportunities so it's been it's been awesome to watch they've got a, a week off this coming week um and i guess it'll give them a bit of time to create new game plans with Roy Gard out. Uh, they're lucky that they've got the likes of TJ Pirinata and the um, the young fellow, is it uh, Villion, um, in, in the wings there. So the next two or three games, I think we'll be able to see whether the Hurricanes uh, are still going to be a major force in Super Rugby without Roy Gard. And I think they will be. Um, they just... I think they'll just have to because Roy Gard is so direct. He's he's like an NRL hooker who just zips out a dummy half and then um, busts through a, a tackle or two and makes a, an easy 20, 25 metres up up the field for you. He just keeps pushing the opposition defensive line back. So hopefully um, TJ and Villian will be able to fill the gap that's left by him and continue on. But, but I agree with Surly that Braden Yossi, has been sensational. He he breaks a tackle almost every time he gets the ball and he gets over that advantage line and just sets that platform for, as you say, that heads-up footy uh, that the Hurricanes have always been very, very good at. So be very, very interesting to see how the Hurricanes go over their next two or three games. Last game was an Australian derby and probably the two uh, best teams in the, uh, in the Australian side uh, of Super Rugby, and it was a, a, a topsy-turvy game, a, a back and forward, and in the end, the Brumbies got uh, over the top with a uh, penalty uh, late in the game, 2019 over the Reds. Pity you. Uh, I don't think I can say I was surprised by this. I, I had the Reds, but you're never sort of surprised when the Brumbies get up and, and beat another Australian team. Wow. I mean, like you said, they're, they're the two form teams that we, uh, if you look at on, on paper and the results, you, you'd definitely be uh, seeing the results being a very close match. But uh, I, I actually picked the Brumbies to to get the job done, even though I was panicking at the end there. I'm thinking, oh, my God, here I am thinking you guys were going to smash them. <laughs> uh, and then you've decided to uh, take your foot off the bloody uh, throttle a, a few times during that game. But um. It was yeah, it was a good game to to actually watch, uh, especially from the uh, over the ditch in terms of how they wanted to play and both teams trying to you know obviously beat the other team uh, when it comes to uh, being top of the top of the ladder in the Australian conference. Surely uh, on the ladder they they are the two best Australian teams with the Brumbies in third place at the moment uh, and the Reds in fifth. Um, could you take anything out of that game that would say, look, I can see the Brumbies or the Reds going on and being a major force uh, when we get to uh, the business end of the season? Brumbies, for me, they're interesting. Like They're almost out of sight, out of mind in a way. They're, they're five wins from six games. They've only lost one game. So they've kind of been like the silent achievers. It seems like everyone's talking about the Reds and their exciting play of footy in terms of teams across the ditch. But the Brumbies, for me, kind of have that Crusaders factor in, in the terms that come finals time, you always know they're going to be there and they're going to push these top teams. They never lose by more than seven points, it seems. They're always in the arm wrestle. And they're a quality football side. It's not easy to go to Canberra and win as well. So if they can finish in that top four, give themselves a home quarter final, and then try come over across the ditch and pull off an upset in the semi, then I think they'll like their chances. For me, it's still the Canes and the Chiefs, despite the Chiefs losing on the weekend. I still think they're the best two teams in the competition. But that kind of next tier down, Blues, Brumbies, Reds, 
you could probably chuck the Crusaders in there at full strength. There's not a lot separating those teams, and it's made for a really exciting competition to watch this year because you go into the round and there's three or four games that could go either way. Pity you would have played a few times in Canberra, uh, and I sort of get the feeling that the Canes always had a, a few issues when they <laughs> went over there and took on the Brumbo. Of course, you were probably facing the team that had the likes of Larkham, uh, Gregan, uh, George Smith. Uh, if we go back a bit further, maybe M Mortlock, and I, I don't know if you played, but I'm sure you would have played against Gregan and uh, Larkham. So it was always a tough test over there. Yeah, oh, definitely. My first ever Super Rugby ga game starting uh, was against the Brumbies. And uh, Gregan was on the, on the other side. Like, this is why, I, like, playing-wise, I hated him. Because <laughs> he was, like, obviously being young, you know, and I'm just still mm. learning my craft. He was telling me what I was doing before I even did it. I'm like, <laughs> what do you want about? I, oh, yeah, I'm going to kick. But how did you know? <laughs> you, you know? And uh, obviously, he... he Definitely a man that's um, done his homework in terms of the person that he was going up against. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, I think we might have got 40 put on us uh, over there, and I think we've gone over there. I've potentially maybe won two times over there, but they were like it was a dog fight. Like it's a, it's a tough place, especially when it's cold, super cold. You think you're back down in Christchurch or down in Dunners. <laughs> And obviously no roof, um, but yeah, it was. It's not a place that you obviously want to go hang out because uh, there's not much going on or at the capital, <laughs> around the capital place of uh, Australia. Not like our capital. Yeah, not like our capital. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I guess you know, it was definitely a, a arm wrestle every time we went over there. Majority of the time was at the receiving end of a, a team that was uh, you know really good. To be fair, George Gregan didn't mind a, a chat either on or off the field. So I'm sure every time you played him, he, he was always keen to offer you some advice. Oh, yeah. Great man uh, off the field. But, I mean, on the field, oh, I was just like bamboozled by him saying, he's going to kick, he's going to come. Like, Hang on. <laughs> my uh, my uh, notes that I've written down. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to this week. Uh, and there are, well, not as many uh, games this week with uh, a number of buys. Game one, Friday night, and we're looking at this on uh, Wednesday morning, New Zealand time, so no teams have been named uh, as of yet. Blues up against the Force, and the Blues are red-hot favourites here. Blues are $1.05 in the match result market. The Force, $8.50. The draws at $31. The Blues are 22 and a half point favourites, and the game total is set at 58 and a half. Uh, Surly, is this just a turn up, do the business, get off the field, take the W, and we're all done for the Blues? You'd like to think so. I'll be interested come four o'clock what, what names are on the team sheet because this is one where they could look to uh, rotate a few players and give a couple All Blacks lads some rest. But, yeah, you'd like to think the Blues at home against the Force side that's probably still uh, soaking wet from their trip to Fiji. They'll still be thawing out, so hopefully they're right for the picking. Uh, historically, the Blues are, have done well against the Force as well, so at home you'd have to back them. If they're full strength, it could be a bit of a cricket score, and they'll look to carry on that momentum from last week. They're the bottom of the table, the Western Force, after the Crusaders picked up their first win of the season last weekend. Uh, Pity, uh, can you see them? Is there any world where you can see them getting up over the top of the Blues this weekend? Yeah, there is. Uh, and it all depends on selection um, and whether they rest uh, key players. Uh, and try and uh, work on a bit of development or giving a few other boys that haven't had a chance to uh, stretch the lungs and legs uh, and also see what their capability is like. But um, I, I guess like that that could potentially be the only time that I think that the uh, force would actually uh, get a bit of an upset. But, you know, I think the Blues have got a, a good uh, bunch of uh, players that can come through uh, and, and get the job done. I mean... They've already found one gym a couple of weeks ago. Mate, no one could tackle them. They were setting up so many opportunities. But, I mean, I think their strike power is, um, across the board is is pretty healthy. 
and so it'll be just trying to work on uh, combinations uh, so that when they if they do start getting injuries later on the in the season, they've got the the confidence to uh, put put players back in um, because they've, they've seen seen them uh, and what they were capable of uh, throughout the the campaign. This does seem like the obvious game for the Blues to rest a couple of top players. They're at home against the bottom of the table, Western Force. It it doesn't seem like they could. I, I can't see them um, not winning this game. But if they do decide to rest uh, some players, there's the opportunity for the force, I think, plus 22 and a half. That sort of comes out. And I think the bookies would move that line if indeed when the teams are named, the, you see a blue side that minus uh, two or three stars. They, they've also got a wee bit of depth, but that can upset the rhythm a wee bit when you introduce... Um, new players into a system when they haven't had a lot of game time uh, for the first six rounds of the comp. So what I heard from you two there is the plus 22 and a half might not be the worst bet to take right now before the teams are named. Um, and if they do reach a few players, then you're probably going to be ahead uh, of the game before kickoff because that, that plus 22 and a half will probably change and move to 21 or 20 and a half. Um, depending on the team's name. So I quite like the way you guys were talking there and you've convinced me to put plus 22 and a half in, uh -oh. in my <laughs> party for a week. I just looked, the Blues have the bye next week, so uh, maybe they don't rest anyone. We'll see. <laughs> right. Next game, uh, the Rebels up against the uh, Drua. Rebels $1.70, the Drua $2.25, the Draws at $16, the Rebels are two and a half point favourites, and the game total is set at 60 and a half. We saw what the Drua did last weekend, surely at home. Not this time, though, uh, and they are, a, they are a different side, and we saw the Rebels upset the Tars, so is that enough for you to take the $1.70 on the Rebels at the moment? uh probably not to be fair i always find it hard to bet against the drawer especially my rulers if they're over here then i bet against them over in new zealand taking on these kiwi sides uh if they're at home you always back them and if they're in aussie i don't mind them with any type of point start i think there's that alternative start of plus 12 and a half and they're paying about a dollar 28 ish i can't see them losing by 13 plus to the rebels so yeah my heart always tells me to back the drawer because uh, i love watching them play i think this will be a high scoring game with uh plenty of points but i don't mind them on that point start uh rebels deservedly favorites off the back of last week but sixth versus seventh uh, i think the draw will be up for this one and they'll look to claim a scalp because to play playoffs footy, you're going to have to win a few games on the road away from home they have shown in the past though that they're capable of doing that Pity, the Drua, uh, they're inside the top eight at the moment. The player in seventh place, uh, they're just behind the Rebels, who are in sixth. They're behind uh, by a bonus point, I think, at the moment. Can you see the Drua uh, doing the business away from Suva? Yeah, I, I definitely can. I mean, uh, although the Rebels are sort of the undercover uh, team in the competition, um, and, you know, obviously they're, they're trying to. Uh, get things sorted off the field uh, in the organisation. But, I mean, I still think that uh, the Dura, no matter what, uh, against in most Aussie teams, I'd actually back them because uh, the style of footy that they play is entertaining. It's it's quick, and they just want to try and move the ball around. But not only that, they're actually quite physical as well. So they'll definitely have a point to prove, um, considering they were a part of that competition a few years ago. Um, and their, their footy just seems to be getting better and better. Right, uh, next game, Chiefs, Moana Pacifica. And this seemed like the ideal game for Clayton McMillan to rest DMAC. He did that last week against the Crusaders. So I'm guessing we're going to see DMAC back in the uh, lineup this weekend, which makes a big, big difference to that Chiefs squad. They are hot favourites anyway, regardless. They're a dollar four at the moment. Moana Pacifica, $9. The draws at 31 Chiefs are 26 and a half point favorites in this match, and the game total is at 62 and a half. Surly, uh, are we going to see an improved performance 
from Moana Pacifica against the Chiefs this weekend? Uh, you'd like to hope so. Over the last two weeks, they've conceded 107 points on defence. So they've really been struggling. They had that trip to Perth to take on the force. And then they flew home before heading to Canberra to take on the Brumbies. That was two weeks ago now. And since then, like I said, they've conceded over 100. So you'd have to think there was a bit of fatigue in there off the back of that trip. I know Sean Stevenson's not playing this weekend, so a couple of All Blacks are getting a rest for the Chiefs. But with DMAC back at the helm, and they'll be stinging off the back of losing last weekend, you'd have to think the depth in the Chiefs will be too good. I'd like to see Moana respond a little and, and put a bit more pride back in that jersey because to start the year, they looked really competitive. But I think Chiefs 13 plus is probably the strongest option here just because, yeah, Moana, they'll be doing a bit of soul searching at the moment off the back of two really disappointing performances. Pity, uh, Chiefs 13 and over is a dollar twenty two at the moment. Can you see any other result than the Chiefs winning 13 and over? Off the back of the last two games uh, in the score lines, no, I don't think that the Moana will be able to do it. But I mean, you never know. I mean, they may be tar- the potential to maybe potentially targeting uh, certain games. Um, but I guess we just we can't really tell until we see the the actual lineup of uh, the Chiefs and whether they decide to uh, rest the nephew there, uh, D Mac, and um, or if they put him back in and. You know, I, I guess it's all up in the air in terms of uh, selection processes, but I would really like uh, Moana to, yeah, like like you said, bring a bit of pride back to their jersey and, you know, go out there and play the footy that we've seen them play because, you know, when they are playing really well, I think it's um, a, a massive, uh, you know, boost for not only their team, but uh, the Pacific Island uh, nations that are involved in, in that whole setup. Right, last game of the round. Brumbies up against the Waratahs. Brumbies a dollar thirty. Tars three dollars and fifty cents. The draws eighteen dollars. Brumbies eight and a half point favourites. Game total at fifty five and a half. Surely, uh, this looks like a. On paper, it could go either way, uh, and I guess we're expecting the Tars to sort of bounce back from that performance they put on last weekend. Can you make a case for them? Mm, I think the Brumbies at home will be too strong. Um, For some reason, every week I look at the Waratahs and think that they're going to be really good. I think it's because they put the Crusaders away, but that's been their one win so far this year. So um, for some reason, that one always rings in my mind whenever I hear the Waratahs. But apart from that, they've kind of been there or thereabouts. They don't really get blown out of games, but they also haven't been winning many. And I think the Brumbies... Will just be too clinical for them they'll look to show that they're still the best aussie side it's starting to get into do or die territory for the tars now they really need to start winning some games or else they're going to miss the playoffs and i did have them winning the wooden spoon earlier in the year that was my big prediction there are only two points or three points ahead of the force at the moment off the bottom of the ladder so i'm hoping that comes through because that was paying pretty juicy for me so yeah i'll go the bundies here to get the win and uh pile on more pain for the Tars. Pity, um, how do you see this game panning out? Is there a clear, uh, are the Brumbies a clear favourite for you? Oh, yeah, of, of course. <laughs> after, like we just talked you, about, after uh, what you've experienced it's been a, it's a stink place to go to and bloody try and get a win. It's always tough because no one really wants to go down there. Um, but I mean, uh yeah, I definitely expect them to at least put um, uh, a fair bit of points uh, on the uh, on the Tars. Right. Let's get to um, the, where we put money down, the part of the podcast. And before we do that, we'll have a look at how we went last week. And I can tell everyone it was terrible. Cheers, uh, <laughs> Paulie. Um, even Izzy, um, who ch- chipped in. Uh, with a four-leg multi, and he, to be fair to him, he wasn't far away. He had the Crusaders 1-12, to 12, uh, the Drua head-to-head, the Canes by 13 or more, 
and he got tripped up by the Waratahs head to head against the Rebels. So there we go. He was one of those many, many multis that got tripped up with the Waratahs going down. So he was probably the closest out of all of us. Surly, now I remember Surly mentioning I'm going to take a six league multi because if I miss by two legs, I'll get a bonus uh, bet back through the mega multi buster promotion. Um, unfortunately for Surly, he missed by three legs, I think, in this uh, six league multi. He had the Chiefs, no good. The Tars, no good. Uh, the Drewer, ding ding. Blues, ding ding. Haynes, yes. Reds, no. Oh, uh, so, uh, unfortunately, not even a bonus bet for Surly with that multi. Um, if we look at Pity, who's been holding us up, and he still has a very, very healthy balance, uh, even after last week. He took the Drua uh, head to head. Um, oh, did you take the Drua head to head? Yeah. Of course, they're at home. I'll put that down as a loss. I'll bet I'll just have to. Oh, re- no. <laughs> I, That's a win. Because I did mine in Seely's first and it was loss, 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 <laughs> loss. <laughs> I just got in that rhythm of going loss. Uh, so, yeah, you actually got a win. You had $50 on the Druid around $1.30. Um, so that was a win. Uh, but then you had a multi Chiefs, Tars, Canes, Brumbies. Um, and unfortunately, you had two losses in there as well. So you don't even get a bonus bet for that one either. But yes, I'll change that later on. Uh, you did get a win with your bet on the Drua at around $1.30. And I had a simple, easy, multi, and two of the three legs lost. So <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. Chiefs, Waratahs, Canes. Um, so... I actually have no idea where I'm going this week. So I'm going to hand it over to Surly and hopefully he can um, put us back on the right track and get us into some winning ways. Yeah, I'll I'll try to. I've got a four-legger here and I've got uh, three teams to win 13 plus, which does make me nervous, but hey, is what it is. I've got the Chiefs 13 plus against Moana, I've got the Brumbies 13 plus against the Tars, and the Blues 13 plus against the Force, and then I've got the Drawer on that plus 12 and a half away point start. That's paying $4.35. I'm chucking the full kitty on that, and uh, fingers crossed there's some big scores this weekend. Right, Pity, you've uh, and I didn't mention it, but I should have. Uh, I'm down four hundred and eighty-seven fifty for the uh, season so far. What's the bankruptcy rate there, Paulie? Well, what's the number where we just call it a day? Is it minus five hundred? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep tuning in, listeners, and this, <laughs> you'll know where the uh, break uh, point is because I won't be here for that show. I'll be gone. <laughs> Uh, Surly is up 187.50 for the season, and Pity is up 578.20 for the season. Uh, actually, he'll be a wee bit more because I haven't factored in his winnings on the Drua last week. So he's probably over 600. Uh, wow, to, to the I, good. I actually need to start doing this with real money. <laughs> <laughs> right, where are you going to go? Uh, so I'm going to do a four leg as well uh, 13 and over for the Blues. Drua, 12 and under. The Chiefs to win. And Brumbies, 12 and under for 50. Under 50. And then Drua on the nose, 50 bucks. They've been very, very good to you. So <laughs> I, I, I can't knock you. Um, I've, I think this is an easy one. But, uh, oh, no don't sense. say it, Paulie. Don't it's say not easy. it. Yourself, Paulie. It's not Maybe easy. you need to start saying this one's impossible. It's, it's never just, gonna win. It's <laughs> cannot win. <laughs> I'm going for a two-league multi, putting the whole hundred on. Two-league multi. Brumbies to beat the Tars at $1.30. Ah, you've cursed it. And if I'm going if I'm going down, I'm taking you two down with me as well. <laughs> and the other leg, either team to win by under seven and a half in the match between the Rebels and the Drua. Um, All together, that two-league multi comes out at 325 100 on to return $325. So Brumbies to beat the Tars and either team to win by seven and un, uh, under seven and a half Rebels against the Drua. So I can have either team um, winning a close one. 
that that's a that's a good one of you sitting on the fence. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> come on, boy! <laughs> I want to see the draw win by eight points. No. Uh, <laughs> outstanding. I can't really argue with Pity. He's sitting at the top of the bloody table there. Exactly. Look me going, what's up? <laughs> you gotta give it a nudge. Right. Uh, also, of course, uh, Super Brew. Um, and uh, look, I put my hand up. It was a short weekend last weekend. I also had a wedding to get to up in Tauranga. I drove up on Wednesday, forgot to put my picks in. So I got zero uh, for the week gone by. Uh, I'm gone from the comp. I cannot get anywhere. I can't. I, I don't think I'll finish in the top 100, to be fair. Uh, but don't forget, for those who are still in there, um, there's an opportunity to win some bonus bets at the end of the regular season of Super Rugby. Uh, I'll hand over to Pity now because he had a very, very oh, good uh, result. I had a great weekend on the uh, Super Brew app. I jumped <laughs> from uh, what was it, 87th to I'm on, I'm sitting in 30, uh, 33rd. Wow. So I've jumped a huge uh, pile of people. With my picks, and it was uh, the one game that everyone picked uh, <laughs> the pass. I actually picked the uh, Crusaders uh, to get the job done, top and under. Wow. Yeah. Surely? Yeah, I was one of those people that pity jumped. I had a, uh, I had a rough week. I was on the Chiefs, um, and I did not have the Brumbies to win. So, yeah, I fell a fair few. I think I'm just in the 100. I'm at, like, 98. So, yeah, really battling there. But, like you said before, Paulie, I'm 180 bucks up in my tipping. So, it's not all it's not all thunderous, you know, not all horrible conditions. We're going all right at the moment. And I do see we have a new leader, which will be a relief to Paulie as well. <laughs> yes, I'd like to... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some very very big things. Who, who was the leader last week? Dan twenty eight is the leader this week, and he had the 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 best round last weekend as well. He's on thirty one and a half points, and he's in front of last week's leader, who is on thirty and a half points. So Dan twenty eight, uh, well done. Keep up the good work, and hopefully you're still up around the top of the table uh, at the end of the season. Uh, we give away some bonus bets. So, yeah, keep chugging along. Keep putting your picks in uh, the uh, Super Roo, uh comp there um, because it's very, very tight uh, at the top uh, of the table there. I think the top 10 are only separated uh, by, what is it, five and a half points. So there's still plenty to play for anyone's game, as they say. But thank you to Dan28 for getting to the top of the table. <laughs> Just need to climb up the ladder a bit more, and uh, <laughs> who was it? Another round of picks. Hauser, Hauser. Right. Okay. Also, don't forget the promotions that we've got on this weekend. Of course, we've still got the Oval Ball Mega Multi Buster, uh, where if you take a four leg uh, Oval Ball Multi, and you can include uh, Rugby League or AFL in that as well. Um, and you take a four leg, a four or five leg uh, multi, you miss by one, you get a bonus bet. If you take a six or seven leg multi, miss by two, you get a bonus bet. And if you take an eight or more leg multi and miss by three, you'll get a bonus bet. So check out all the T's and C's at the, on the TAB website or on the app. Uh, I think we've got some, what have we got? Same game claims as well uh, on the Blues Force game this weekend and Chiefs Moana Pacifica game, that would be a good game to just throw in yeah. three or four or four or five try scorers maybe uh, yeah. once the teams are named. In fact, both games are probably good to uh, throw in a few try scorers. And uh, if you're successful, well, then you'll get your winnings. Um, and if you miss by one in those same game uh, claim matches, uh, then you can get uh, earn yourself a bonus bet there as well. So opportunity there. They look like the ideal games to take a few try scorers and sit back and enjoy the game. Mm. I think that's about it for this week, boys. Uh, we've covered just about everything. Uh, you've you got a big weekend ahead, pretty after being over the hill at the farm, eating and feeding animals. and uh, Probably a little bit too much eating. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we just got a, um, obviously, our coach first of things, so at Wellington College, so we've got a game against Palmerston. Uh, Palmy this week, Palmy North boys, and um, 
in Kilburnie. So, is that part of the season proper, or is that a? No, nah, that's still preseason hitouts. Uh, this is still, well, I think, is, is one of our traditional games against Palmy uh, that they've reintroduced. Um, but we play it sort of outside of uh, the regular season with uh, the comp down here. Um, so we're still having a few headaches uh, in terms of selection processes, um, which is a good, healthy thing to have as a coach. Uh, otherwise, it's who can we utilise to play more than one position, <laughs> which you don't want to give uh, these boys. They, you want to try and uh, keep them uh, in their preferred positions. So, yeah, pretty busy. And then, obviously, I coach a women's, uh, girls' league team, my daughter's league team. So be coaching them on uh, Sunday, making them... Is that age grade uh, under fourteen quarter uh, uh, team? Yep. Oh yeah. Is that what? what is that the school or Wainui? No, nah, no, nah, it's not the. It's it's our um, Maori uh, rugby rugby league club that we we take our girls away to a tournament in July, and so we've already started. Uh, I've been training them for maybe about a month now. Well, myself and our our coaching staff, and yeah, it's been pretty good. We've had a few mini tournaments where uh, a couple of teams come down from Levin and Palmerston North come and play. And one when we just went up there not long ago uh, and had a little um, jam against uh, them up up in uh, Levin. So yeah, it's been been pretty good for the girls and just trying to make sure that they understand how good fitness can be and especially <laughs> in league. <laughs> so you tell them to push up and they're just two steps and standing. Go, hey, <laughs> keep running. <laughs> what position does he play? My daughter plays wing centre. Oh, I've been trying to convince her to play fullback, even though we've got a pretty decent fullback, but it's more for later on. She must have got her speed from the, from her mum. Definitely not from me. <laughs> <laughs> My brother got all the all the good genes, the the size and the bloody speed, while I had to fight for everything. <laughs> are we talking about Billy now? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Sealy. What are you up to this weekend? Uh, we've got our first comp game for in the um, North Harbour Prems competition. So, yeah, we're taking on uh, Mahurangi. So, looking forward to that at home. Pre-season's over. So, now we get to have some fun and actually get into some comp games. So. Fantastic. What position are you playing, Shirley? Uh First five. So, Ooh. yeah, it's, it's about a year 13 or something for me in the Prems now for the coat. So, yeah, it's getting close to 150 games. So, that's the goal. So are you are you the ten that they hide on the wing or fullback who and put someone else in their position or? Oh, defensively, ab absolutely. When we've got the ball in hand, though, there's no one else that's allowed to touch oh, it. That's exactly. for sure. But yeah, I like to think of myself as the poor man's Quake Cooper. Just stand out the back, um, bark at the boys, try not to get the jersey too dirty. But then when attack is on. 50-22s all day long. You know? <laughs> and hated by the opposition, <laughs> by the crowd. Boom, oh, it's really again. Oh. They all sledge me, eh? They're like, oh, you're that guy, blah, 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 with the sports thing. And they all just try to get on the podcast each week, the bastards. So it's good. <laughs> standard, that's standard. Don't worry, my yeah. blood piece of them boys a little bit like that. Well, yeah. <laughs> here's, here's your opportunity to push your case to Scott Robertson because uh, well, there's a vacancy at 10 for the black jersey. Yeah, maybe. Try my hand at nine as well. I don't think I'd be fit enough, though. There'll be some slow ball from the breakdown. <laughs> You'd be asked to do what I did. Someone else play halfback, please. I'm still getting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> oh, sensational. Right, well, uh, all the best with both of your uh, endeavours this weekend, lads. What are you doing? I'll be watching rugby. Uh, I'll be watching quite a bit of sport. Um, oh, and I'm going to head down to Trentham on Saturday, last group one of the season, the one or two sires. Um, so I'll catch a, a bit of that. Um, but it'll be, yeah, racing and sport for me this weekend. Um, just a, a nice, quiet one, actually. Uh, I'll enjoy it. Um, Hopefully, not too quiet so you don't forget your, yeah, no, I'll get your my, super brew. Uh, I'll get my super brew picks, picks. in this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm rocking up the table this weekend. Um, so. Yeah, don't forget, if you're in that Super Brew comp with us, uh, get your picks in as well. Don't be like me. Um, enjoy the Super Rugby this weekend. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you again next week uh, when we discuss all things Super Rugby with Pity Weepu and Surly. <laughs> <laughs>